linoleic acid, which is really the fat that we're pointing a finger at in this story, um, it is it is everywhere in animal fats. So there's no avoiding it. Of course, we're eating, you know, orders of magnitude, I think 56,000% more now than we were 100 years ago. When we're getting it from refined foods and, and just straight kind of cooking oil, versions of soybean oil and canola oil, etc., we are not only getting way too much, of course, but even if we were getting more modest amounts, we're not getting it the way nature intended. When we eat linoleic acid from animal sources, it always comes with antioxidant vitamins like, say, vitamin E. I think there's something kind of genius about this where if you can get linoleic acid and keep it as linoleic acid, the body knows what to do with that. And in fact, Stephen Kunane, who we often invoke in the low-carb realm because of his incredible work on ketones and Alzheimer's disease, found years ago that linoleic acid and the seed omega-3 alpha-linolenic acid are the highest burned fats in the brain for energy, and it makes them actually ketogenic. The brain makes its own ketones from these polyunsaturated fats, linoleic acid and alpha-linolenic acid. But it stayed as linole linoleic acid. In other words, it didn't turn into a lipid peroxide. And, and maybe that's because it had antioxidants to keep it clean. It helped maintain the integrity of that fatty acid. In contrast, when we're eating it from a refined source, um, not only we're eating too much, but let's put um, volume or consumption amount to the side, but we've robbed away the natural, perhaps, antioxidant mechanisms that would have allowed the cells of the body to just use the fat in its pure form, we've changed it now into a lipid peroxide. And that, to me, is the real heart of the matter. And uh, where I, t I cannot deny that linoleic acid has a problem beyond its caloric value, where they would say, no, it, it's soybean oil isn't really a problem beyond the fact that we just eat too much. I can, I can nod my head to that a bit and acknowledge, yeah, we definitely eat too much. But I can't overlook the fact that it truly is the most readily oxidized, turning into a lipid peroxide, um, of the lesser saturated um, or more saturated fats. This becomes a lipid peroxide very, very readily. And lipid peroxides are remarkably damaging or pathogenic molecules where we know that these lipid peroxide metabolites from linoleic acid force a fat cell to grow through hypertrophy it limits the potential for hyperplasia. And so if you have fat cells that are being told to grow because there's sufficient energy and sufficient insulin, you have to have both of those. If there's ample linoleic acid and its peroxide metabolites, it's forcing that growth to happen through hypertrophy. And that is a sick way to get fat. We are literally doing studies in my lab now looking at some of these linoleic acid metabolites and how they change mitochondrial function in muscle cells and fat cells. And it is not good. It is something that goes beyond um, the saturation of the fat um, and, and just the pure amount of calorie. In the presence of enough energy and insulin that then um, the omega-6 fatty acids can potentially be detrimental to the fat cells, specifically linoleic acid, um, that it can cause it to grow improperly and lead to mm -hmm. insulin resistance. So to flip that on his head then, if someone um, was in a hypocaloric diet or if someone had low insulin levels, then would you think the effects, the negative effects would be um, attenuated or just simply not present in that context? Yes. In, in the context of metabolic function, yes. I think in, in a state of low energy and low insulin that the negative effects of linoleic acid peroxides um, or related peroxides at the fat cell would be mitigated, that it wouldn't matter as much if you're not allowing adipogenesis because there's no stimulus for adipogenesis. The stimulus is for lipogenesis or hypertrophy rather than hyperplasia. So yes, I think those consequences would be mitigated at the fat cell and then insulin resistance in a broader level. Adipogenesis, formation of adipocytes, fat cells from stem cells. Lipogenesis, Acetyl-CoA converts into triglycerides for storage as fat. But having said that, I'm not saying that the lipid peroxides wouldn't be damaging in other ways. There are other things that these lipid peroxides can do to, say, alter mitochondria as, as it's altering the lipid profile in cardiolipin. So I'm not saying even then 
that that now we can give the linoleic acid a, a clean bill or, or, or a green light. No. The observational is the worst, the clinical study is the best, and the mechanism explains what we see in the clinical study. Or, or it doesn't, and it was, just wasn't that relevant. It was only relevant at the level of a cell, um, and, which is too artificial of a model. So yeah, on the observational end, there are so many potential biases that get their way worked in, that, that get worked into those kinds of studies, like healthy user bias, where people who are avoiding saturated fat they are right. in, in favor of, say, seed oils because they've been told it's healthy. They're engaging in other healthy habits that just don't get accounted for in the questionnaire that they've been given. So I give very little weight to the observational studies. In fact, I think that's one of the plagues of modern nutritional science. I, I don't think epidemiology should be used in nutrition. I think it should only be used in, in true diseases. Big clinical studies, again, no surprise to your audience, the Minnesota coronary experiment, the, the Sydney Heart study, which was almost as good as you could get in, in controlling an environment over many, many years, a long enough period of time to actually measure death. You know, you and I both know most clinical studies are a few weeks, maybe a few months at the most. You just can't measure death in a few months. Mm -hmm. But these studies were, were, were very big. And of course, the bigger it gets and the longer it gets, the more potential error you introduce. But they they totally refuted the idea that these polyunsaturated fats were better and in over overeating saturated fat, and in fact suggested that the focus on, on polyunsaturated fat at the expense of saturated might in fact have been harmful. Um so so that's what those two studies showed, that it was actually perhaps a net negative to yeah. to cutting back saturated and focusing more on polyunsaturated. I think too many people misunderstand the relationship of linoleic acid to inflammation. What they do know is that linoleic acid can be converted into arachidonic acid. And then arachidonic acid can be converted into pro-inflammatory and pro-clotting molecules like prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Prostaglandins, hormones created by chemical reaction at the injury site. Unlike other hormones, which are messengers, Prostaglandins are not secreted from a gland, but are created at the time and at the site where needed. Thrombochains are lipid eicosanoids. Two major types, A1 and A2, helps in blood clot formation. And, and so the, because that pathway exists, they assume that linoleic acid is pushing that pathway forward. And, and that doesn't happen. Um, linoleic acid is converted to arachidonic acid by nature of regulatory enzymes. And, and, and it's, it's a need-based system. So we're breaking down linoleic acid into these potential pro-inflammatory metabolites as the cell may need them. And the cell does need them. These are molecules that are essential to survival. Inflammation, of course, is essential to re recovery and, and healing and immunity. I don't think this is a system we can push forward with more linoleic acid. Because remember, linoleic acid has alternative fates, including just simply being burned for energy, which mitochondria do perfectly well. Whether it goes into arachidonic acid and then so on or further depends on the need and the activation of those regulatory enzymes to actually pull that process along. If linoleic acid is in fact promoting inflammation, and it very well could, <clears throat> I would say it's likely because of its conversion into um, lipid peroxides. And we know that macrophages will very hungrily engulf lipid peroxides, immediately sensing this peroxide as a harmful pathogenic molecule, and then doing its job, it will engulf them, and then it will become a foam cell as it has engulfed too much. This lipid peroxide will start to activate. Uh, the macrophage is essentially saying, hey, there's too much of this, I need help, and that is inflammation. It's when one immune cell starts to call out for help from other immune cells, and now we have systemic inflammation. So if linoleic acid is driving inflammation, it's because of it, it having been converted into a lipid peroxide. The macrophage, without a doubt, engulfs that, and that would then in turn stimulate inflammation throughout the body. So I don't think it's a direct effect. I think if you remove the immune cell, uh, the phagocyte, eating that lipid peroxide, I don't think there is inflammation. Macrophage. Immune system white blood cell that engulfs and digests anything that doesn't have on its surface proteins that are specific to healthy body cells. 
phagocyte, cell type that has the ability to ingest or digest foreign particles, such as bacteria, carbon, dust, or dye. I, and I fall into this trap too, speaking of oxidation and inflammation as if they're one and the same, which I, they're not, they're completely not, but sometimes yeah. we get lazy and talk about them as one thing.